In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, I a poor, a miserable sinner, sinner confess, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and with thy spirit. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and strength, the author of all godliness, hear the devout prayers of your church, especially in times of persecution, and grant that what we ask in faith we may obtain. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading today is Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 to 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is Psalm 103, verses 1 through 12. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless, Bless the Lord, Lord O my soul, soul and, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from 
This morning's epistle lesson is recorded in the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or you? Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him as many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, 
Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went out and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Our service continues today as we profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our service continues with this week's children's moment, which is entitled, Peter Escapes from Prison. We hope it speaks to you today. Hi, this is Pastor Jim from Emmanuel Lutheran Church here in Easton, Maryland. We're back this week with another children's moment. This one is entitled, Peter Escapes from Prison. Let's get started. Peter was one of Jesus' disciples. He told many people the good news about God's Son, the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. King Herod wanted to stop people from hearing about Jesus. He had Peter arrested, locked him in prison, and was going to sentence him after Easter. Christians everywhere prayed day and night that God would keep Peter safe and set him free. For three days, Peter was chained up and guarded by the king's soldiers. The night before Herod was going to sentence him, Peter went to sleep knowing that God was with him. In the middle of the night, an angel woke Peter up. A bright light filled the prison. Get up quickly, the angel said. Put on your clothes and sandals and follow me. Peter did what the angel said. As he stood up, the strong iron chains that Herod's soldiers had used to lock him up fell off his hands. He was free. Peter followed the angel past the sleeping guards. All the locked prison doors and iron gates opened by themselves. Peter thought he must be dreaming. Once they were out on the street, the angel vanished. Peter knew that God had sent his angel to save him from King Herod. His friends could hardly believe that Peter was free. Peter's story tells us that God will help us when we need his help. You can trust in him to be with you no matter what happens in your life. Let's have a short prayer. Dear Jesus, help us to trust in you like Peter did. Help us to know that you will be with us and walk with us through whatever comes our way in life. Let us know of your presence with us always. We ask this in your most precious name. Amen. Well, that's all for this week. If you'd like, you can download some pages where you can print out this story and color the pictures on your own. Go to emmanueleaston.org and look for the Children's Moment link for more. Blessings. And we're back from the video. Our service continues then as we finish singing the song. 
I lay my sins on Jesus. Today's message is entitled, What Happens at 491? We begin with prayer. Dear Jesus, help us to forgive as you forgive us. Help us to forgive one another in that way and to bring forth fruits of forgiveness in our lives and share that in the lives of those around us. We ask this in your most precious name. Amen. It's interesting in this gospel lesson, right at the beginning, there's a question on how you translate this. Is it, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven, or just as appropriate from a grammatical standpoint would be 77 times. So depending how you choose to do that, today's sermon title is, What Happens at 491? So you can see I'm choosing 70 times 7. Or it would be what happens at 78 if you choose the other. The same point applies. What happens? What happens at sin number 491? Let's unpack that a little bit today. Look at the numbers that are used. The king forgave the servant's debt of 10,000 talents. Now how much is that anyway? It doesn't really speak to us unless we can get somewhat of an idea. So according to what I've been able to find out, one talent is equal to about 6,000 denarii. Today that would be around $1,000 plus or minus, some have suggested. So 10,000 times since he owed 10,000 talents would be somewhere around $10 million. That's a pretty big amount to repay. It's an enormous sum of money, especially in Jesus' time of history. In his history of Israel, Josephus said that one year's tax paid to Rome from the Holy Land, quote unquote, was less than 1,000 talents. Well, here's where it gets really crazy then. If this servant worked as a common laborer, it would take over 10 million, yes, 10 million days labor to pay back what he owed, or a little over 27 years. And that doesn't take into account any interest. It just simply shows that the amount that this servant owed was an enormous back amount that he could never, ever pay back. But now look at the second servant. How much did he owe the first? 100 denarii. Again, that number doesn't mean much to us since we don't deal with that currency, so let's break that one down too. 
A denarius was a common day laborer's wage. So that's one day's labor for each denarius. 100 days labor is what he owed. Is that doable? Well, that's doable. It would be difficult, yes, especially if he had to take care of his family, if he did have a family, but it would be possible. And so the point is to compare the difference in the amounts that each one owed. The first servant owed over 100,000 times more than the second. He who had been forgiven an impossible amount to pay back. What did he do? Was he willing to share that forgiveness? To be as generous? No, he was not. Remember, the first servant, the one who owed his master over 27, yeah, 27,000 years of, of labor begged his master, have patience with me and I will pay you back everything. And the master amazingly responded in mercy and out of pity for him, Jesus said, the master of that servant released him and forgave him of the debt. Shouldn't he have done the same for others? Shouldn't he, in joy of being forgiven this great amount, wiped clean, shouldn't he have done likewise? Yet what did he do? He found a fellow servant who owed him the equivalent of 100 days labor. And the text says, and seizing him, he began to choke him. That's not being friendly. That's not being forgiven. And said, pay back what you owe. Well, his fellow servants were rightly concerned. They wondered, how could this fellow, who had said exactly the same thing as the first fellow had said, have patience with me and I will pay you back. How could he not have shown that same forgiveness? Well, did they live happily ever after? No, no, the story takes a terrible turn then. The first servant had the second servant thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. It's awful hard to pay off a debt while you're in prison. So think it through. Look at the enormity of what the first servant was forgiven. The enormity, 27,000 years of labor. And then look how petty he was for this other fellow who owed him 100 days of labor. Shouldn't he, in his joy, freely forgiven that which was owed by his fellow servant? It's easy to point it out in others, isn't it? It's harder when it gets personal. So let's make it personal. Let me ask you, for you, what happens at sin number 491? The most amazing story of forgiveness I've ever read is by Corey Tenboom. She shared this experience in her book, The Hiding Place. She and her family had hidden Jewish families in Holland in their home during World War II. Her entire family was imprisoned in concentration camps and if I remember correctly, most of them died, including her sister Betsy, who will be referred to here. Can you imagine this? After the war, she went around speaking about forgiveness and restoration. This is a portion of what she experienced. Let me quote her. It was at a church service in Munich that I saw him, the former SS man who had stood guard at the shower door in the processing center at Ravensbrück. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time. And suddenly, it was all there. The room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, Betsy's pain-blanched face. Again, Betsy was her sister who died in that camp. He came up to me at the church, was empty, beaming and bowing. Fraulein, he said, to think that, as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine, and I, who had preached so often to the people in Blumenbaum, need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin in them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. 
was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I pray, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing, not even the slightest spark of warmth or charity. Again, I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him. While into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love itself. Think about that last statement. When God tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love itself. So let me make it personal again. Back to the question. In your life, what happens at sin number 491? I also read of Leonardo da Vinci, who was painting The Last Supper, had a bitter argument with a fellow painter. Bitter argument. Hated the fellow. And so he decided to get even. Of course, that's what we do when we have an argument with someone, at least our sinful nature wants us to do that. And he painted this enemy's face in as the face of Judas. Everyone knew who it was because everyone knew about the feud they had. Well, he continued to work on the painting until he came finally to Jesus' face. Yet, as much as he tried, he couldn't paint the face of Christ. Something held him back. After some soul searching, he came to see that his hatred toward his fellow painter was the problem. He repainted Judas' face, replacing the image of his fellow painter with another. And then he asked this painter, his rival, to forgive him. It was only then that he was able to paint the face of Jesus and complete the manuscript. Are you like Leonardo? In your life, what happens at sin number 491? What's the number of times that you are willing to forgive? Seven? 77, 490, Simon Peter was willing to forgive up to seven times. He thought he was being extra generous. At the time, the Jewish rule of thumb was three times. Jesus responded with either that 77 or 70 times seven number. Does that mean we can stop forgiving at number 78 or 491? No, this parable, this giant contrast of one being forgiven so much over 27,000 years of labor and then unwilling to forgive a debt equivalent to 100 days of labor. It shows us that like God, we need to forgive without limit. How many times are you willing to forgive before you say enough? Or like Jesus, will you forgive without limit? Remember, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He forgave and continues to forgive our sin. He has no limit to the number of times he'll forgive us. God, in his grace and mercy, freely and fully forgives all of our sin. As disciples, we seek to live as Jesus lived. Who are we then? to hold on to the sins of others against them? Should we not, in response to the great love and forgiveness that God freely gives us, freely forgive the little which others have done against us? Jesus' ending of the parable is quite amazing. Let me quote it. 
And in anger, his master delivered him over to the jailers until he should pay off all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. In last week's gospel lesson, Jesus gave what some call a forgiveness outline to follow. His goal was that you might restore the broken relationship you have with another. That's what sin does, doesn't it? It destroys relationships. The relationship between us and God, the relationships between each of us and others. What he had to say is simple to say. The difficulty comes in implementing it. It consists of three simple yet important parts. One, speak to the person who has wronged you privately. Your goal is not to assign blame as that you're the guilty person and I'm completely innocent. Instead, your goal is to restore the broken relationship between you and this person. If that relationship isn't restored, meaning that forgiveness hasn't been given and received freely, you go on to the next point. Number two, take two or three along as witnesses. It's not to be those ganging up with you on the other person like some people think. Instead, these are people who are to work with you both to help get to the bottom of the problem. And once they do, to help you as you get there to restore the brokenness through forgiveness, forgiveness of one another. If that doesn't happen, you go to the next part, part three. Jesus says to take it to the church, the worshiping community. If that person will not listen to the church, then he says, treat them like a Gentile and a tax collector. In our society, many people think that means you shun them, have nothing to do with them again. Instead, how did Jesus treat them? How did Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Tax collectors? He ate with them, and he forgave them. Again, he wants to restore that broken relationship. Being restored into a relationship is the goal of those words of Matthew chapter 18. It's really the goal of Jesus' entire mission, if you think about it. The reason he was born into our world in the first place. Remember again, God shows his love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here in this parable, we're to learn to forgive as we have been forgiven by God. That means to forgive without limit. Dear disciples, whom God has forgiven a debt that you could never repay, are you truly willing to forgive as you have been forgiven by God? He who forgives us our Lord and Savior Jesus calls us to forgive like he did, to forgive without limit. Let's close with prayer. Gracious Lord, help us to be people of forgiveness, to be willing to forgive others as you willingly forgave and continue to forgive us when we sin against you. We ask that you would change our hearts to soften those that are hardened against another who has wronged us in some way, and to see that our goal with them needs to be a restored relationship. Help us not to keep count of the number of sins, but instead to, like you, freely forgive as we have been forgiven by you. We ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith until life everlasting. Amen. Our service then continues with the words of the Alphatory.
Our service continues then with the prayers. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Lord, we continue this week to pray all who serve in so many different ways in the different parts of government, be they our president, vice president, congressmen, senators, governors, mayors, legislators, judges, whomever it might be, that you might bless them all in the performance of their duties. Help them to work together, we pray, especially in these days as we face difficult times and difficult decisions need to be made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for peace and tranquility in days of civil unrest and violence. We continue to pray that there might be liberty and justice for all. Watch over those who serve, police officers, other public safety officials. May they carry out their duties honorably and legally and keep them safe as they serve on our behalf. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for hearing and answering prayers. We thank you that you have been with Molly, Kate, and their families whose homes and livelihood were not threatened as first thought by those California wildfires, but were able to safely return home. We pray that all who have suffered from those fires and others may also return home safely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And gracious Lord, we continue to raise up people who are seeking to rebuild their lives torn apart by windstorms, hurricanes, and fires, especially those out west. We pray that you give them hope and a future in days where they see no hope possible. Let them know that you, Lord, walk with them every day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Gracious Father, comfort all who mourn. This week we remember Joe's family as they mourn his recent death. Comfort them all with the assurance of the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. May they look to you for strength and hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we continue to pray for those who are sick or suffering physical ailments of any kind. And so we pray for all of those suffering from coronavirus, as well as for Jeff, Pat, Sherry, Dan, Stan, Nick, Debbie, Hadley, Jeff, Rob, Nadine, Don, Ralph, Pastor John and Joni, Wayne, George, Sandy, Robert, Norma, Peter, Donna, Mary, and Carol, among others. Comfort them in their distress. May your hand of healing touch them even this week. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. And watch over those who continue to serve in the military wherever their service takes them. Today we remember Sam and Phil, Colin and Dash, John, Corey, Kyle, Scott, Tori, Matt, Ryan, and Noah. Please keep them safe. Let them know that you walk with them every step of their journey no matter where they are. And bring them home safely to family and loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Watch over all who are homebound, especially Don and Hildy. Let all who are homebound know of your presence with them. Help neighbor reach out to neighbor and help those who need assistance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The Lord be with you. And, and with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Our closing song is, appropriately enough, Lord dismiss us with your blessing.